<laughs> okay, and now I'm going to tell you that I'm actually not going to talk about that. <laughs> because about a week ago, I sent a, a mail and said, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, the creation of Xbox. And could you change, like, uh, the title of my talk? And maybe it was too late to change it or something. <laughs> so, but in the Q&A section, which I'm going to keep an eye on, I'll make sure I have time, I do spend a fair amount of time fixing Bronze Age arcade machines. I do want to give that talk at some point. It's a pretty, um, I, I think this, uh, this talk will be more broad audience, more, but more people care about it. But if you want to chat o uh, old arcade games, I did just fix a gunfight uh, the other day. So I actually fixed it twice now. But anyway, it keeps breaking. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's nice to be here. It's, I, I, I'm a little frazzled. I, my plane landed at 4.30, so, and it's 6, and then I was like, I'll, order, I'll call up an Uber, and the Uber's half an hour just to get to pick me up at the gate, so I was, wasn't sure I was going to make it here, but I made it. It's good. I'm here, so here we go. So um, let me tell you uh, just about me and how I got into this stuff, how I ended up at Microsoft, and then I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, the, the creation of the Xbox and some crazy stuff that happened along the way. Um, so I grew up in Seattle, grew up in Bellevue. I had two parents who were both engineers. My dad was an electrical engineer, my mom was a chemical engineer, and then when I was uh, getting out of basically elementary school, my mom went back to college and got a master's in computer science. So I grew up in a pretty technical house. Uh, I, you know, in the early 70s, they were always bringing home stuff for us to play with. Yeah, pocket calculators, that was probably the first thing I learned to program. Uh, building electronic stuff with my dad. Uh, my older brother went off and became an electrical engineer, and I followed in my mom's footsteps and became a programmer. Um, uh, basically, my programming started when I was in high school. Uh, I got uh, an Atari 800 for Christmas one year. Uh, I was hoping for an Apple II because that's what we had at school, but uh, I got an Atari and uh, it turned out to be an awesome machine to work on. Um, and I just basically started uh, to teach myself to program, first in basic, and then when that wasn't fast enough to do the kinds of games that I was seeing in the arcade, I started uh, working in assembly language. Um, and I guess my big break came as a high school kid. I was working at Shakey's Pizza, you know, playing video games on the side. Um, and uh, I had written a Frogger clone called Froggy. Um, and this little company down in California called Ramox saw my Frogger clone, and uh, they tracked it back to me, which is pretty amazing. They found the right Eddie Freeze in the country, um, who was a high school kid working at a Shakey's Pizza, and said, do you want to write games for us? Absolutely, yes, I do. Um, and so uh, that was 19, uh, right about 1982. Um, so I started to work for them on the side while I finished high school and then went off to college. Uh, I made three games for them on the 800. They're all uh, collectible because <laughs> we didn't sell that many copies, but look for Ramox. Uh, if you want the ones from me, you want – Froggy had to be renamed. We're, they were afraid we'd be sued, so uh, they made me change the cars into jousting knights and give it a medieval theme. So it uh, became Princess and Frog. Uh, so Princess and Frog, uh, then I did a game called Ant Eater, uh, which is not the arcade Ant Eater, and uh, then I did a game called Sea Chase. By then it was 1984, and the entire game industry, as you know, melted down in 84, um, and I was out of a job. I was halfway through college, and I was writing games to help pay for my college, so I had to get a real job. I started working in the computer center at school. I started to look for summer jobs back in my hometown of Bellevue, Washington. Um, and Bellevue, Washington happens to be adjacent to Redmond, Washington. People probably know Redmond is w the home of Microsoft. So one, one spring I sent a resume to Microsoft and uh, they, they liked what they saw and they flew me back up home for an interview uh, during spring break and uh, hired me. Um, and so I worked as an intern for that summer, summer of 85. And they liked the job I did that summer, and so they hired me full-time. They offered me a full-time job when I graduated from college in 86. So anyway, fast forward. So I, I um, basically, uh, yeah, things went pretty fast over the next 10 years for me. They hired me in to work on Excel. So I was 
uh, the youngest of seven programmers who were working on the first version of Excel for Windows. Uh, we, worked, we were trying to battle Lotus. Lotus 123 was the biggest PC product in the world. Lotus was bigger than all of Microsoft, so we felt like we had a pretty important job, just seven of us trying to beat this company that was bigger than all of Microsoft. And so we worked on that game, or that, <laughs> that non-game. It's hard, I know, I've done so many games since. We worked on that program, shipped it, uh, and uh, the group grew from seven to 15, and we did more Excel, and then it grew to 35, and by then all of us original seven were managing small teams, and then it became a group of 50 programmers, and I was the lead programmer by then. This is after about five years. Um, and um, anyway, so I'm working on Excel. My boss gets called over to run Word. Okay, so now we're talking about early 90s. Um, so the, the head of Word leaves. My boss gets promoted to run Word. He goes over and um, immediately has a big fight with the development manager on Word. And the development manager gets mad and quits. And so my boss is like, hey, Ed, why don't you come over and work on Word? And that would be a step up for me now. So I, I, and I like this guy, so I'm, I'm sure I'll come over and work on Word. Programming's programming, right? It's all fun. Uh, so I go over to Word, and um, now I'm managing 60 people, OK? I've been at the company a little over five years. Um, and I'm also programming on the side, because I love to program. But now I have a job where I have to manage 60 people and also write code, because writing code is fun. So I do that for the next five years. Put out a bunch of words. We battle Word Perfect, uh, which was the leading word processor at the time. Um, and everything's good. Um, and so it comes to the point where I've been at the company almost 10 years, and they're like, well, the next thing for you to do, the next step in your career is to run a business at Microsoft. You know, maybe you should go run like the PowerPoint business. That would make sense. And I'm like, yeah, but if I ran a business, I couldn't program anymore. And they're like, yeah, that's true. You wouldn't be able to program anymore. Um, I'm like, but I love to program. <laughs> I mean, there's really only two things I love. I love, you know, I love programming and I love video games. So, you know, like when I wasn't at work, I was home playing all the greatest games. And, you know, early 90s was a great time to be a, <laughs> a PC gamer. Um, so they didn't care about that. They're like, you should go to California and run PowerPoint. But I cared, so I looked around the company, and there was a, a small games group at that time in the company doing Flight Simulator and not too much else. And I said, why don't I run that group? And they told me that was crazy. Why, the uh, multiple vice presidents called me into the, their offices. Um, they said uh, I was committing career suicide if I left office to go run this games group. Uh, another vice president said to me, why would you leave office, one of the most important parts of this company, to go work on something no one cares about? <laughs> so I'm like, I care about it. I think games are great. I think they're really important. So. Um, so I put my foot down, I said, no, this is what I really want to do. And they kind of rolled their eyes and they were like, okay, fine, go waste your career, go work on your game thing. And they let me go take over this little group. And uh, so that was, we're talking mid 90s now. Um, and it was great, it was really great. I was, I was worried whether I was making the right career choice until a week into the, into the new job, they're like, oh, we have a trip planned to Japan. You wanna come to Japan? I'm like, yeah, I'd love to go to Japan. Um, so we go to Japan, we meet all these amazing game developers. Uh, it was incredible, it's just, just incredible. I'm like, I love my new job, <laughs> my new job is great. Um, and uh, and uh, really, it turned out to be good in another way too, and that is, um, you know, when they said to me, why would you leave office to go work on something no one cares about? I didn't really realize they meant it so literally. I mean, they really didn't care what I was doing, you know? <laughs> like, as long as I wasn't losing money for the company, I could do whatever I wanted, you know? So, I mean, my, what would you do, right? You, you work for this big company, they don't really care about what you're doing, but you've got a group of 50 really hardcore game people, 
you know, and you can pretty much do whatever you want. What would you do? I mean, I bet you would do what I did. I bet, I bet you would, like, just go all over the world, try to sign up all the great game developers, everybody's game who you've ever played, who you thought was great, who you had respect for. You'd meet them, you'd talk to them, see what they want to work on, and then you'd try to get them on your team to make games for you. You know, and so that's what we did. We ran all over the world, met with every great game designer you can think of, and we started to put more and more game deals together. And actually Chicago, since I'm here in Chicago, I should talk about Chicago for a minute. Chicago was a really important source for us of great game development, great game developers. Um, of course, at the beginning, our core product was Microsoft Flight Simulator, which was made by Bruce Artwick organization right here out of Chicago. My predecessor had just acquired that company. So when I came in, the first job I had was to move all the people from Chicago who made Flight Simulator out to Seattle and get them all settled and working on the next version. Um, so that was the first time I raided Chicago. <laughs> This, uh, a few years later, we're doing pretty good. We had shipped Age of Empires, which was made by a, a great group, Ensemble Studios, down in Texas. And that was a big hit for us. And so between the money coming in from Flight Simulator and the money coming in from Age of Empires, we could reinvest and do more acquisitions and try to grow the business even more. And so I came out here again and uh, bought uh, FASA, Jordan Weissman's company and moved Jordan and his team out to, to Redmond. And Jordan has been a friend ever since, an amazing game designer, creator of Battletech, MechWarrior, Crimson Skies, uh, Shadowrun, many franchises that, that people know. So anyway, that was the second time I raided Chicago. Uh, so, Things are going pretty good. We're, we're, the group is up to maybe four or 500 people. You know, we're, we're growing, we're, we're making money, we're making better products, better games. Um, and then one day, I'm sitting there in my office and these crazy guys come in from the DirectX team. Okay? And they said, we wanna make this DirectX box. And so if, if you don't know, DirectX is the Windows, it's the name of the API, it's the name of the interface between programs and Windows for things that are, have to do with gaming, okay? It's the gaming part of Windows, say it that way. So anyway, I'm like, what, do you, what, do you, what is this DirectX box? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, and they're like, well, it's going to look like a game console, but it's really just going to be a PC. You know, PC running Windows, and you're going to stick a game in, and it's going to act just like a game console. It won't, it won't, you know, show the Windows logo or anything. It'll just boot the game. But really, on in behind the scenes, it's going to be copying the stuff off the game disk onto the hard disk, and it's so it's going to act to the customer like it's like it's a PlayStation or, or a, you know, N64 or something. So. I was, you know, naive, and um, uh, I also thought, I, you know, I thought about the console market. I thought, well, you know, we had grown a lot in the PC market. It was getting tougher to grow our market share. Uh, it would be nice to get into the console business because that's a big business. And here were these guys saying we could have a Microsoft-branded console that was basically a PC in disguise. That would be great for me because I have all these PC developers. I don't have any console developers. So if I wanted to like make console games, I'd have to work with completely different developers. I'd have to, you know, make different kinds of games. But this thing sounds like out of the box, it could just run basically games we have today. Uh, which turned out, all of this turned out to be false. But anyway, <laughs> pretty much. Um, so um, I'm like, all right, I'm on board. Let's do it. Um, and that's where we, we start to get into Microsoft politics. Um, and, you know, Microsoft, one way to think of Microsoft is like this giant turf war fought between these big groups. You know, everybody has is, is got their area staked out, you know. So, like, I had games staked out. If someone else in the company was trying to make a game, sooner or later they'd have to go through me. So, you know, I would, like, end up getting that in my territory. Um, 
You know, so in this case, who else had game console territory? You know, these DirectX guys wanted to do it. Well, it turned out there was another group in the company that had already tried to stake out this territory. And that has to do with Sega. Does, any, does anyone know about, can, can anyone guess this? Nope. 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 Dreamcast. Windows CE on the Sega Dreamcast, that's right. At Microsoft had acquired this company and along with it had come some guys who had worked at 3DO. And the 3DO guys had convinced the Windows guys, the Windows CE, the embedded version of Windows guys, that they should get into the console business. And then they went to Japan and they twisted Sega's arm really hard until, I think probably by piling a lot of money on the arm, until it bent so far that Sega put a little Windows logo on every Dreamcast because you, there was a way to boot a Dreamcast into this Windows mode that no one ever used. And so that team was like, all right, we achieved a great job with Dreamcast, now we're on to our next thing. So they wanted to build a console, we wanted to build a console. So then in, when two groups at Microsoft both want to do the same thing, then you have to have a, a, a battle, right? And so that was the next step for Xbox, was we had to have, we had to have the battle. And, and the way a battle works at Microsoft is, each group gets as many vice presidents as they can on their side. So we went out and we gathered a bunch of vice presidents and they went out and they gathered a bunch of vice presidents. And then we go in front of Bill and Steve Ballmer and we're like, you know, here's our plans. So they presented their plan. They were, their plan was basically they were gonna build something very similar to a PlayStation 2. It was gonna be completely custom, custom hardware, custom software, uh, just built for games. And then it was our turn and we we're like, ha, that's so silly. W you know, we're, we're, it's not just silly what they're proposing, it's really off strategy, which is about the worst thing you can say to somebody at Microsoft, that their plan is off strategy. You know, that means it's like not, not following the religion of the company or something, it's off strategy. So they were off strategy because are they running Windows? Are they, is it part of the PC ecosystem? No, it's like totally custom, this thing. You know, we're, we're on strategy, <laughs> you know. We're, we're making a, a, a PC in a box that runs Windows. Heck, Dell could build this for us, maybe, you know. Dell, other people could build this. So Bill and Steve, you know, they listen to both sides and then they have to pick and they bless our project. They bless the Xbox and the other project, <laughs> blown away. Their, their jobs are gone. They got to find new jobs in the company. Some of them come knocking to work for us. We, we let them in. We let them in. Um, <laughs> but now, now we have to actually figure out what we're going to do because all we really have at this point is like a PowerPoint presentation. So we spend the next year trying to figure out what we're actually going to make. Um, and this, so this is the year between 1999 and 2000. And the more we look at it, the more what these 3DO guys were saying is making sense to us and the less our own plan is making sense to us. I mean, could we really have this thing running Windows? I mean, Windows isn't great for games. It gets in the way. It takes up a lot of memory. It's, you know, it's a, it's a problem, you know. And could it really be just like exactly like a PC? Or wouldn't it be better if we really had some custom hardware that was unique, you know, that would make it perform better? So we kind of, our plan kind of slid more and more towards their plan. We didn't go all the way to where their plan was. But it was, we, we slid closer to their plan. Maybe ended up somewhere in the middle. And the biggest part of that slide was when we dropped that it would run Windows, okay? So the thing you gotta know, I worked for a guy named Robbie Bach. And one of Robbie's real great abilities was managing up within the organization. This was probably how he got to be 
a senior vice president of the company. He was really good at managing his bosses. And one of his great skills was something that we called pre-disastering, okay? And, and pre-disastering, uh, in Robbie speak, pre-disastering means that, let's say we're gonna have a big meeting with Bill or Steve. Before that meeting, Robbie would be on the basketball court with them, you know? Would, this would be with Balmer, not with Bill playing basketball, and he would just let slip, oh, you know this thing we're gonna show you two weeks from now? Yeah, it's not, you know, we, we had to change this thing, or we had, you know, we're, lose, we're gonna lose money on this project, but it's okay, we're, we're gonna make it up later, blah, blah, blah. And so by the time we would walk into a meeting normally, they would already know what we were gonna say. They'd already know all the bad news. They had been pre-disastered, okay? And so we would, sometimes we'd be in these product reviews and, and pro one team after another would get up and they'd get up and just, Bill and Steve would just bam, pound these guys, and bam, pound these guys. And then we would get up and we would give just as bad news as the other guys. And they would just kind of nod and shrug and then we would move on. And the other people are like, why did that happen? It happened because they'd been pre-disastered, okay? That's the important thing. But we had this big important meeting coming up. And this was the meeting where Xbox was either going to be approved and it was going to go forward or it was going to be killed, okay? And that meeting took place February, February 14th, 2000, okay? So either, on this Valentine's Day, either we were going to get approval and then the next month we had it set up so that Bill was going to get on stage and announce the Xbox to the world at the Game Developers Conference or the project was going to be canceled. Well, for whatever reason, Robbie failed in his pre-disastering going into this meeting. And this is a meeting that we call the Valentine's Day Massacre. <laughs> and so this is kind of a famous meeting in the lore of Xbox. Um, and so we walked into the, the boardroom for Microsoft. This is about as serious as a meeting could be at Microsoft. You know, and you're gonna have the CEO, you're gonna have the president, and then many, many vice presidents there to hear this presentation. Okay, so we go into this meeting. Bill's a few minutes late. He walks in and he's got the, he's got the deck for the meeting, the PowerPoint slides in his hand, and he slams them down on the table and he says, this is a fucking insult to everything I've done at this company. Okay, that's the opening line of the meeting. <laughs> so, clearly pre-disastering did not happen. This is the first thing that we realized. And the second thing we realized is we know why he's mad. He's mad because a year before he had picked our team over this other team because they were off strategy, and now we're off strategy because we're not running Windows. Well, whose fault is that? It's not the hardware guy who's sitting next to me. It's not me, I just make the games. Now Jay Allard, he's in charge of system software. So, Jay, we all turn to Jay, but Jay is, Jay is not saying anything. He's still in shock from the Bill Gates shock wave that spread out across the room. So Jay's not gonna say anything, fine. I'll say something, so I try to defend it. Bill yells at me, shoots me down. Robbie tries to defend it. Robbie gets yelled at, he gets shot down. Now Jay's got his voice again. Jay stands up, you know, tries to defend it. Jay's getting shot down. And by then, you know, Balmer's also getting his turn. See, the way it would work is Bill would be all about all the technical stuff and Balmer would be all about the business stuff. And Balmer is like flipping through the deck and looking at the business slides. And the business slides, frankly, were pretty terrible. I mean, we were going to lose at least a billion and a half dollars, probably more, over the life of this project. Um, and that was probably optimistic. Um, so as soon as Bill runs out of steam, then Balmer's on there, bam, you know, why are you losing all this money, you know, blah, 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 you know. So, so they're taking turns, you know, and they're yelling at us, and they're yelling at us, and they're yelling at us. And um, 
and, and you know, Robbie and I had been at the company for 15 years at that point, and we were used to getting yelled at by these guys, but still, by their standards, this was a, like a lot of yelling coming our way, you know. Um, and we're just, we're just basically saying the same thing. We're like, we looked at this for a year. We're really confident that this, if you want to do this, this is the best way to do it. We don't know if the company should do this or not. We're not saying you should blow a billion and a half dollars or not. We're just saying, if you're going to do this, this is what it's going to cost and the best way for us to do it. So basically, we just kept saying that same thing over and over again. And they kept yelling at us over and over again. So it's 5 o'clock. It's 6 o'clock. It's 7 o'clock. It's Valentine's Day. Did I mention it's Valentine's Day? I mean, all of us have, like, you know, girlfriends or wives or whatever back home. We have reservations, you know. So now we're going to be in trouble not only at work, but also at home, right? This is getting really serious. Um, and they're just yelling at us, you know. And then there was just like, you know, it's coming up on 8 o'clock. By now, we're, we just know we're screwed at home, you know. It's like we're going to miss our... We're going to miss whatever reservations we have. Um, a guy, a kind of a random vice president who hasn't said anything this whole meeting, waits for a certain lull, and then he says this. He says, what about Sony? And we knew what he meant. Everyone in the room knew what he meant because when he said that, this guy had been sending these almost conspiracy theory type memos for the last couple of years. And his theory basically said that um, Sony was quietly building a, a thing that would be a competitor to Microsoft in the home. Remember, Microsoft's core motto is, you know, a, a computer on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software, okay? And so when he says, you know, Sony's putting like a hard disk over here, you know, in like a TiVo type device. And they're putting a keyboard over here and they're putting computing power over here. It's all part of a grand plan from Sony to integrate these things and to basically take over the home and kick Microsoft completely out of the home. That's the way his theory went. Okay. So anyway, but he doesn't have to say all that because he's been writing these memos for months. So he says, what about Sony? And uh, Bill kind of pauses and he says, what about Sony? And then Balmer looks at Bill and says, what about Sony? And then they're looking at each other. What about Sony? And then Bill says, we're going to do this. We got to do this. And then Balmer says, yeah, we should do this. And then, and then Bill's like, we're going to give you guys everything you asked for. I know you wanted to be off on your own separate campus so the rest of the company wouldn't mess with you. I know you've got, you know, you've got all this money. You want all these resources. You want to hire all these people. We're going to do it. And Balmer's like, yeah, we're going to do it. We want you guys to go out and do this thing. That part of the meeting took five minutes. Yeah, this is after being yelled at for almost four hours. That part, five minutes. And the meeting was over. And we walked out of the meeting. We were still screwed. It was still Valentine's Day. But our project had been approved. And I, I just, I turned to my boss, Robbie, and I just said, that was the weirdest meeting I have been in in my whole time, 15 years at Microsoft. But that was how the project started. All right. I gotta take a drink. I'm gonna finish up in pretty quickly, maybe 10 more minutes, and then I can take questions about Xbox. I can also talk about Halo 2600, if there's anybody who knows what that is. I can talk about fixing old arcade machines, which I do, which you can read about on my blog, edfreeze.wordpress.com. Uh, mostly b Bronze Age stuff, but anyway. So, so a project was approved, and now 
kind of the next day it started to sink in what that meant because it was February of 2000 and I knew that we were shipping in November 2001. So that meant I had less than two years to pull together an entire launch lineup for this new console that didn't exist, for hardware that doesn't exist and a lot of software that doesn't exist. Um, and that's basically, that was a crazy two years from then on out. And that's the third time that I raided Chicago was uh, about, a month I about a month later, uh, my phone rang, and it was a guy named Alex Seropian. Um, and Alex runs, or at that time, ran a little game company here in this area uh, called Bungie uh, with his partner, Jason Jones. And they told me that they were going out of business. They were a small developer, publisher, and life had been getting harder and harder for developers to also be publishers. Um, Walmart didn't want to talk to 37 little developers. They wanted just to talk to a few big guys. Um, take Two, they had already sold a third of the company to Take Two. Um, but I knew them. I, I had played their game Oni, and I, I knew it was very good. Um, I'm sorry, not Oni, um, the one before that. Real-time strategy, no, forgetting it now. Anyway, um, so are you interested, he says. I'm like, yes, I'm very interested. Uh, he says, we have this thing called Halo that we're working on. I'm like, yeah, I've seen the trailer, I'm interested. Um, he's like, well, Take-Two owns a third of us. I'm like, okay, I'll talk to Take-Two. So I get on the phone with the head of Take Two, and we negotiate, and we come up with a deal. And the deal is um, Take Two can have all of Bungie's back catalog, all the games that they've ever made. And they can have the intellectual property for all of that. They, uh, we will finish the game Oni, which I misspoke about earlier. We'll finish the game Oni, which is in development uh, in a part of Bungie that was in California, and, th and we'll give it to them finished, and then they can ship it. And all I want is this crazy new thing called Halo and all the developers. That was the deal. And they agreed to it, and that's what I got. And, of course, that turned out to be the key to the success of the launch of Xbox was that one game. We did a bunch of other games. Um, uh, you know, another Chicago company we worked with was High Voltage, uh, who's still here. Uh, another one, Day One, maybe some people know. Uh, they did a, a game called Mech Assault with us. So a lot of stuff came out of Chicago. Um, I'm sorry I moved so many people out of Chicago to Seattle. Uh, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so we did that. Uh, Lorne Lanning, uh, one of the biggest early deals we did was with Lorne Lanning to make a, a game called Munch's Odyssey. Uh, that was another big launch title for us. And coming into launch, we didn't really know. We didn't really know what, well, we didn't know if the console was gonna be successful at all, but we really didn't know what game was gonna make it be successful. We loved Halo. All of us loved this game. I mean, it looked great, it played great, um, but the press didn't love it. The press had a lot of negative things to say about it. And for a few reasons, we had showed it at E3, um, in the summer just before launch. And at that time, we still didn't have full speed hardware for our Xboxes. So the Xboxes were running at half speed. The graphics part was running at half speed. And the Bungie team made the decision to show four player split screen multiplayer, which was a cool thing to do on any console, but it's like the most demanding graphical thing. And then you're running on a machine that's half speed. So the press didn't didn't like it, but they were also saying that this game kind of just proves that you guys don't get it. You don't get the console world, you know? This looks like a PC game. It's like you took this PC developer and you made a PC game. Nobody does first person shooters on consoles. I mean, okay, there was, you know, GoldenEye, but that's with that wacky Nintendo stick. So, um, you know, so this just, this just shows you guys don't, don't get it. And we'd be like, well, but we have Munch's Odyssey, you know, that's, Lorne Lanning, that's, he's, we stole him away from Sony. Uh, they'd be like, all right, fine. So, so anyway, going into launch, would it be Halo? Would it be Munch's Odyssey that would be the big hit? Would it be something else? We didn't know. Um, but the good thing is we had a huge pile of cash to spend on marketing. So we spent the money, we, we marketed everything, and we launched, and Halo was super successful. 
Um, and, uh, and the Xbox was really successful. And that's basically the story of how we made the first American game console in 20 years at that point. And it's still around today, so it's good. So I'm just going to wrap it up there um, and then take questions. I, I have no idea what the units are. I would, I would look at the Wikipedia article and see what it says. We did, we did well in uh, North America. We outsold Nintendo in North America, which was a huge thing for us. Uh, we did less well in Europe. And we did terrible in Japan, really, really bad in Japan. And I could talk specifically about that if people want to hear it. Yeah, Jason. Oh, OK. Halo 2600 question. He asked if I'm bank switching. Um, so I really didn't want to bank switch, which means on the Atari 2600, the maximum address space that machine can deal with is 4K without bank switching. So I, I wanted the game to fit in 4K, and it does. The binary is 4K. And uh, that made it hard. But that hard part is also what's fun about it for me. I mean, I think I don't get, I mean, I'm not trying to rag on someone else's entertainment. But I mean, there's people who make games for the Atari 2600 now that are basically like, computers in the cartridge, you know, and it's basically just driving the output through the video. I mean, and they look beautiful. Um, and they're huge. They're 32K, 64K even. But it's like, I don't know, just make a Atari 800 homebrew then. I mean, I mean, I think the challenge of working on an old machine is to try to live within the constraints of the system. And yes, people did bank switching back in the day. And they even shipped custom hardware, like Pitfall 2 had a custom music processor and extra RAM. But I don't care. I mean, I mean, to me, the fun is just living within those constraints. You've got only 128 bytes of RAM. You've got only 4K of code address space. And you're running on a very slow processor. You have no frame buffer. Um, it's a really, really difficult machine to work on. And that's what's fun about it. So um, anyway. Yeah, it had to be 4K. I also did a Rally, a Rally X clone that's also 4K. So, no. All right, what else? Yes, sir. Yeah. How many different things did you do in parallel in that mm. time? That's a great question. We would normally have about. 50 to 60 projects in parallel at any one time. So a lot of projects. And, uh, and, and we would start a ton of things, and many we would kill. Uh, we had three games. We, we, bu we built this whole special relationship with Steven Spielberg, and he was part of our launch, saying nice things about the console, because he had this big movie coming out. And we built three games, three different genres of games around this movie. And then I went to the Hollywood premiere of the movie, which was kind of exciting, and all the actors were there. And the movie opened. Does anyone know the movie? It's a movie called AI. <laughs> and then we went back and we canceled all the games. <laughs> and we, yeah. and, but that's the game business. That's entertainment business, you know? Uh, not everything works out. You have to try a lot of things in parallel, absolutely. So. Yes, sir. Yeah, there was a long tradition of building Easter eggs into, um, into our products. And it was, um, there was, there was a really weird rule internally about it. The rule was that the code for the Easter egg could be obvious, but the way that the Easter egg actually happened could not be obvious. So there would never, you would never just see a call to the Easter egg. There is always some weird way where you were, building some number in memory, and it was actually a pointer, and you're going to jump through that pointer to jump to the code, something like that. So, um, so that's one, one thing. Um, uh, by the way, I, if you, just to plug my blog a little bit, I do have an article there about what I think so far is the earliest Easter egg in an arcade machine, and it's in Starship One. 
and it's a fun story to read. So if you haven't read that, read about how I found out uh, that this Easter egg existed and then tracked down and reproduced it. But anyway, um, a lot of the really out of control ones happened after I left. So the flight simulator happened after I left. The Doom one happened after I left. The version that I was technical lead on, the Easter egg, uh, this one I've never seen written up, but you know, if you got the right version of Excel, which would have been Excel 3, um, and you did the right sequence of commands, which I have no idea what it is, uh, what would happen is something that I had a dream one night. And, and in, the, in the dream, there was this copy of Lotus 1, 2, 3. We were very focused on this being the enemy. To give you a sense, I had applied to Lotus, like when I graduated from college, I applied to a lot of people, and I got a rejection letter. Well, that went right up over my desk, you know, so every day I could look up and see the rejection letter and then work hard to destroy this company. But anyway, <laughs> um, so in my dream, there's a copy of Lotus 1, 2, 3, and it's sitting there, and then it starts to shake, and then it bursts open, and just bugs crawl out of it and crawl all around the, the, the box. And so that's what, we, that's what we tried to capture in the Easter egg. So <laughs> it's a great question. All right, you had one. Right, how do we make sure that the Xbox wasn't already outdated as far as graphics power goes? I mean, every console that ships is sort of by definition outdated in a sense, because you know, NVIDIA will come out with a $2,000 graphics part and you're not gonna have that. I think in a lot of ways we got really lucky with the first Xbox. I think the hardware that we shot for, it just barely, barely came in on time. I mean, we got the final parts maybe somewhere a month to two months before, and then that had to go to manufacturing and come back for launch. Um, so um, I think we shot about right. If we had tried to get I I anything more power-wise, uh, we wouldn't have had it. It, it would have delayed our launch. Um, our launch was delayed by one week. We, were, we wanted to um, ship on uh, November 8th, and we shipped on November 15th. And the reason we did was because of actually 9-11. Uh, so uh, right when we were in the middle of kind of the final stretch for making the Xbox 9-11 happen. And it affected us in a bunch of different ways. First of all, we were all spread around the country, all the senior management promoting the, the product and you know meeting with developers, meeting with the press. I was in San Francisco that morning. My boss, Robbie Bach, was in New York. And then we were trapped <laughs> wherever we were, right? I just watched this. There's a great musical uh, called Come From Away about all the people who got trapped in Newfoundland. Uh, really, really great. But anyway, uh, we were trapped in our different places. I managed to get a flight out of San Francisco uh, about four days later. But Robbie had to rent a car and drive from New York to Seattle, which was kind of an epic trip. Um, but uh, we were the makers of Flight Simulator. Uh, and, you know, Flight Simulator had been used by the, uh, the pilots to train, which was awkward. Um, we had uh, our big racing game, Project Gotham Racing, which was racing through the streets of New York. And so we had meetings where we were like, well, what do we do? Do we take out the Twin Towers now or do we leave them in? We ended up taking them out. Um, um, and then it's just all the ripple of it, all the way up to launch. Our launch was in New York, and we were already locked into that. We there was a new Toys R Us that was opening on Times Square, and we had bought out all the electronic signs all around Times Square, so it had Xbox everywhere. And then we were gonna have this huge line of people waiting at midnight to get Xboxes, and the police kept showing up and breaking it up the line, because they didn't want large groups of people standing together. I mean, you, you gotta remember what it was like back then. You know, this was like two months after, <laughs> after the event. So, uh, but we were able to go through with the launch event and, uh, and it was okay, it was okay.
Yeah, so people had put bigger processors in it. Um, I am, I'm much less a hardware guy than a software guy. Jason knows this better than anybody. Um, my understanding is that the architecture of the original Xbox is very much very PC-like. Um, they, they tweaked some things at, to create sort of copy protection, but that copy protection was really mostly there just to try to make the other publishers feel good about that it, their stuff wouldn't immediately be duplicated. Um, we had, um, there was kind of a scary group of Middle Eastern programmers, not Middle Eastern, Middle European, like from Romania or something. I don't know, I, you didn't ask too many questions about these guys, but they're like, what? yeah, give us your Xbox and we'll, we'll try to break it. They did it in three days, you know. Um, so, so we knew that the, the protection wasn't gonna last very long. You know, after we shipped this guy, uh, Bunny Huang or something like that, wrote a whole book about cracking the Xbox and everything, and it's great, I'm happy he got famous for that. But these, <laughs> these Romanian guys did it in three days. Um, so anyway, it was very, it was very Xbox-like, or very PC-like architecture, so I think to, to really answer your question, I think you could do something like that, sure, why not, as long as it was fit with the North Bridge or South Bridge or whatever those terms mean, which I don't really understand. Okay, oh, uh, Hughes first, then you. I, I seriously just got off the plane and came straight here, yeah. I was going to say that I didn't know, but when you asked, the name came into my mind. I mean, I was going to say I'd forgotten his name, but it, I actually just remembered it. His name is Craig Mundy. Um, did I thank him? No way. <laughs> I probably should have. <coughs> I mean, to be fair, we had... Um, we had actually tried earlier on in the project to partner with both uh, Nintendo and Sony. So we, I was at the meeting when we met with the senior guys from Nintendo and talked about could we work on a game console together. Um, that was part of that one year of research that we were doing. And Bill Gates had a private meeting with Kutaragi and had made a similar kind of, kind of appeal. Hey, maybe we could do the software, you guys could do the hardware and we could work together and that appeal was rejected. So we didn't feel too guilty about it, maybe. But yeah, Craig Mundy, yeah. About that time, around 2000, is the first time I heard of the concept of bricking and uh -huh. game consoles in general being that. I don't really know which one was the first one, but um, what did you So I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to answer a slightly different one. Um, I'm going to take your question as like, what was the thing about the hardware that we were most worried about and that we that maybe upset us the most? And it actually turned out that there was a problem with the original Xbox um, power, the way that the, the power was handled into the Xbox. Um, and uh, some Xboxes burst into flames. I think one might have burned a trailer down somewhere, trailer home down. Uh, so that was a, actually something that didn't get a lot of press, but that was actually something we were very worried about. It came about a year after it was shipped. Um, and we, a we actually went out and, and I was surprised we didn't get more flack for this, but basically the way we fixed it was by putting out a new power cord for people. And we started shipping it with a, a power cord with some kind of, um, you know, like, um, uh, I, I don't know what, what, the word's not coming in my head right now, but, um, it, you know, basically like a, a, uh, a surge suppressor in the, in the cord. And so we shipped a lot of new cords, but that was actually because of a, a, a problem with the um, power supply in the original Xbox. 
Uh, the original Xbox, it was all built in, so it didn't have a separate power brick, uh, right? Um, so that, you reminded me of a different story, but the actual bricking of the consoles, I don't remember, I don't, I don't remember there being a problem with like an Xbox Live or system update that left the machines bricked, which would have been the case that we would have worried about. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost out of time. I'm gonna take this one last question. I don't wanna take away the, the next talk's gonna be really good on Hubert, so. Right, so the good thing was the architecture was basically like a PC. So all the early dev kits were PCs. Maybe you saw the early Xbox prototypes. It was this big silver X. It was basically just like laptop motherboard stuck in there um, in, a, in a fancy looking case. So you could do a lot of work on, um, on PCs and that's what we did until pretty, pretty late in the project. Yeah, yeah it's kind of funny because there's a whole business of charging money for uh, dev kits and we're basically shipping people dev PCs but charging them $10,000 and calling it a dev kit, you know, that kind of thing. But that wasn't my crew. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. I don't want to take the Kubert guys' uh, time, but uh, I definitely want to stay and see him talk. So thank you very much.